7.30. We have, we have a quorum, so we're going to get started. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Town Board of the Town of Austin work session for Tuesday, March 15th, 2020. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to and the to Republic the for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So today is March 15th not just the Ides of March, but also Equal Pay Day, marking the date um, to which an, on average, women need to work beyond the end of the year to earn as much as men did on average in the year of 2021. This is a stark reminder of the existing pay gap between men and women, a gap that is even wider for women of color. On a positive note, March 15th is the earliest we've ever marked Equal Pay Day, meaning that year after year, we continue to make progress, moving in the right direction to close that gap. This Women's History Month lets do the work necessary to achieve gender equity by fighting discrimination and investing in childcare, home healthcare workers, and other barriers women face to join uh, and stay in the workforce. For those of you in the village of Briarcliff Manor, you have exactly an hour and a half until 9 p.m. to cast your ballot in the village election. So head over there now. You can catch us on YouTube later. Voting is happening at the WJV Community Center adjacent to the Briarcliff Manor Public Library. There are two vacant seats on the village board of trustees that are, who are on the ballot or which are on the ballot. It's so important to make sure your voice is heard in local elections. Congratulations are in order for Austin residents Anna Guzman and Diana Lemon, who will be honored with State Senator Elijah Reichlin Melnick's Women's Leadership and Empowerment Award later this month. We are lucky to have incredible women leaders in our community, some of them sitting right around the Zoom, Zoom table. Um, and Anna and Diana are two phenomenal women, very deserving of this recognition. The next installment of the Austin Public Library's Talk Culture Literary Book Club curated by Barbara Robinson will be this Saturday, March 19th at 3 p.m. March's book selection is Letter to My Daughter and the Complete Poetry by Maya Angelou. Grab your copy at the circulation desk. You have three days to speed read it. I challenge you. Be sure to register on OPL's online calendar. I think they're also having a book and craft sale this weekend, if I saw that correctly. Victoria Caffarelli, you can maybe pick up some yarn for your knitting. Looking forward to whatever you're going to make next. Very exciting. The Austin Downtown Revitalization Initiative call for projects is open through March 31st. Community organizations and businesses can apply for projects to win part of the $10 million allocated to the Village of Austin's downtown in this year's cycle. We have a link to the call for projects on the town's website in my supervisor's update under other government updates. And you can find more information on the Village of Austin website, www.villageofaustin.org. And now for our work session agenda this evening. First up, we have a special guest from Sustainable Westchester, Nick Tedrow, with an update on the Westchester Power Community Choice Aggregation Program. This program, which the town joined when it started in 2015 with the all green energy option, has been particularly beneficial to town residents in recent months with Con Ed rates skyrocketing while the CCA rates are fixed. We're looking forward to hearing more from Paul and continuing our support of this program this year. I'm sorry, Paul. I said Paul because that's what I was expecting. But it's Nick. Nick, take it away. Okay, sorry. Love on you. sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, great. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having me here today to talk to you uh, about the CCA. I'm actually a Austin Village resident, so good to be talking to our neighbors here. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> So I'll, I'll be quick here, just do a quick background on who we are, what the program's about, and uh, where we're looking ahead and uh, let you know about and hopefully get your support on uh, in the coming months. So um, 
Stable Westchester, we're a consortium of municipalities here in Westchester County, and we have a variety of different program offerings, as Sean Scott is seeing here. Um, and obviously, we're here to talk about Westchester Power. So, a little plug here, also, actually, uh, before we get into Westchester Power stuff, we are getting ready um, to roll out, uh, hopefully, opt out community solar credits. Um, so this is going to be a new exciting offering uh, that we're going to be providing through Westchester Power program itself. Um, so that will be able to provide guaranteed savings to participating households and businesses, prioritizing uh, in the initial stages, low to moderate income households. Uh, you know, so, you know, looking particularly maybe at folks who are enrolled in utilities, low income assistance programs like HEAP and you know, are generally classified as assistance program participants. So. Um, this is something just to be aware of that's, you know, coming down the line here imminently, and you're going to hopefully get some email information sent to you from the solar team. So you see Leo's contact information there, and you can reach out to him directly if you have questions. And then just, you know, if this is something that's on your radar and you're interested in it, no, you'll have to amend your local CCA enabling law in order to add the solar credit um, to the supply offering. So uh, we'll have a template of that as well for you all. Anyway, Westchester Power, uh, 29 of the 44 participating municipality or member municipalities participate in our CCA with Yonkers joining this month actually uh, to make it the 29 total and really uh, bring our uh, customer uh, residential small business account number up to you know close to 150,000. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, uh, you know, in a snapshot, we are the flagship energy program of Sustainable Westchester. We provide 100% New York State renewable energy at competitive prices, and we are a program that affects only your electricity supply, uh, not the other parts of your bill like the delivery um, or more gas, delivery and billing still managed by Con Edison as your utility record. Uh, so... Okay, in case anyone doesn't know how energy works here, a uh, very basic snapshot, it has to get generated somewhere. So typically and predominantly that's been um, and still is to date from fossil fuel sources like coal or, or things like that. Uh, it gets deposited into the electricity grid wherever it's generated from. And then a lot of that is managed so that delivery and, and maintenance by your utility and delivered to your home where you have the choices about where your energy is sourced. Um, and your ability to support clean energy, which is what we do here. And you see our little hydro plant graphic to represent our hydropower sourcing through our program. Uh, and again, this is an opt-out uh, format. This is something that's come up again a lot recently with our rollout in Yonkers particularly. So structurally, it's, it's the same as, you know, Con Edison as it works for folks who, um, you know, sign up set up their account, then they automatically start getting Con Edison supply without another option. So uh, in contrast to that, this program has been vetted and adopted by your local municipality. So your representatives have uh, voted, I guess it's mostly the representatives here I'm talking to. So, um, you know, this is a, a difference in that, you know, it's an actual community choice and you have a choice uh, for the first time. So, uh, you know, and as mentioned, we're bringing cost effective means of accessing renewable energy for community members who that's important for. And then, uh, yeah, the opt-out structure has really enabled us to go out and, and secure these uh, really competitive price contracts uh, by being able to leverage that buying clout of all of our participating municipalities and residents. So that's been a successful model uh, thus far in terms of impact with GH, uh, yeah, greenhouse gas impact uh, countywide through the program, 1.1 million metric tons of CO2 mitigated, Austin Town, 17,000 of that, and you can see the uh, corresponding estimated impact and translated into more tangible terms uh, that people can grasp onto beyond uh, or more so than metric tons of CO2 mitigated. Um, so this is an EPA estimate calculator that we use to give you these, these figures. So we're having a great impact and progressively that just stacks on as we continue to move through time and we're really, you know, uh, helping with Austin support. Uh, lead the, the charge in the state on making huge gains towards our GHG emission reduction goals um, as we move forward here into the next decade. So the current contract and where we're at here now, um, coming upon the end of, I should say, so these are, our current rates are fixed through June 30th, 2022. This contract started in January of 2021. 
uh, the renewable supply and the standard supply have uh, the fixed rates, as you see here, 7.41 cents per kilowatt hour and 6.75 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and as the supervisor mentioned, you know, particularly now with where rates have gone uh, because of the energy market and all the geopolitical factors and other things going on that are pushing prices uh, for a lot of things up, the energy market has really faced a lot of upward pressure. So we do feel, um, you know, fortunate to uh, have this conservative model that uh, offers this fixed price and, and has, you know, hopefully for participants in the program, uh, been able to shield a lot of folks with a lot of the volatility that uh, all of us experienced at our bills at large over the last couple of months. Um, so we, we think these are going to be really valuable rates while they last for the next few months, given where, where things are headed in the market. Um, and that's, you know, I referenced the variable rate there. Con Edison is purchasing uh, a portion of their supply on a rolling basis uh, as we go through time. So they're, uh, you know, very exposed to the market as it fluctuates. Passes the cost of it. They have to. Um, and then, yeah, um, again, the Con Ed supply is just a market offering that standard, the cheapest they can get, basically. So that is predominantly uh, a fossil fuel base and not the 100% renewable energy. So, um, you know, particularly encouraging with things right now, at least in the program to say, uh, okay, 7.141 cents per kilowatt hour for renewable um, has turned out to be a really uh, reasonable and, and successful outcome for this current contract over the course of uh, the last year plus. So, uh, and again, it's a con it's a consumer friendly program. This, this program is for folks to join opt in, opt out as much as they want, switch supplies as much as they want. And that fixed rate that we mentioned provides a lot of security and assurance of the month to month of knowing what to expect with their bill, which is a, a huge value add that we now see more than ever. So the rates today, I know this graphic's not exactly the easiest to consume, but it goes from our inception back in 2016, all the way to 20, uh, February, 2022. Uh, basically what it's showing here is we've been, you know, on the average, really competitive, um, I think actually a little bit better than Con Edison through since our program's inception. So um, we hope to continue and, and uh, continue to do even better on that front going forward. And then just one more you know, snapshot of the current contract rate performance, what I was just mentioning, uh, these estimated values. So average accounts for usage for accounts on the residential and small commercial for Austin town uh, since January 1st of last year. You can see a breakdown of you know how our costs shake out compared to Con Edison on average uh, for a period. So um, yeah, even the renewable, our, our premium product, so to speak, is has been very cost competitive and better on the average than Con Edison would be. Uh, so that's where we're at now and where we're headed. So why I'm <coughs> excuse me, why I'm here to talk to you is to you know discuss this impending contract and uh, in tandem with what we're envisioning here at Sustainable Westchester and the next evolution for the program, we we'll call Westchester Power 2.0, and uh, the strategies we have to really take our our program and increase the impact environmentally and economically for our residents in our county. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, this is basically focused on in the immediate term for sure, increasing the supplier pool. So we have you know, even more enhanced competition for our contracts than we've, we've had to date, um, you know, bringing more, more suppliers into the mix so that we can really, really have competitive uh, auctions for our supply. Um, so then alongside with that, building structures. So continue to build out what we have now foundationally here on, uh, on our administrative side and, and what we're able to do and doing some you know, capacity building uh, will support us in, in locking into longer term contracts and add in more things, graph more things into the program, um, so like, like different dynamic rate offerings, and, and really just make us a more flexible organization and program. Um, and then all of that will lead to longer term price stability, hopefully, and, and again, you know, increase partners, increase opportunities to actually do actual renewable construction within the county and, and actually, you know, bring more direct uh, green supply. Uh, into our communities through these uh, advancements or enhancements of what we're trying to do. So currently, how we've operated to date, uh, this right side of the screen, you know, Westchester Power 1.0, we are working directly 
with ESCO. So we run our auction. Uh, ESCOs, who are the only ones in New York State that have the authority to actually supply retail customers, um, come to the auction and you know bid on our supply, and we award a contract basically based on price more often, and go from there. This is a bit limiting because you know one ESCOs having the authority, only authority, excuse me, to supply retail customers limits the pool from the actual suppliers as uh, not all wholesale electric producers are actually ESCOs um, for one reason or another that doesn't fit their business model and, it, and it's not an appealing you know, role for them to play. So there's a lot of wholesale generators out there who don't act as ESCOs and therefore we can't work with in our current model. Um, so, and then on top of that, we wanna work with an ESCO who's of a rep, you know, reputable size and can ensure, you know, with our huge customer load that we have, um, you know, is, is going to be able to deliver on what we need. So there's a lot of, you know, pressures around that to really expand the supplier um, market out there for ourselves, especially when we have a volatile market and upward pressure and, and a lot of things being squeezed. So the idea with 2.0 is that we want to tap into the wholesale market and solicit bids uh, from more energy providers, those wholesale providers. So um, you know, what we're thinking is we have a vendor who's available to us um, who can act as sort of a, a sleeve, so to speak, for wholesale energy suppliers. So basically what they bring to the table is all of those functions associated with being an ESCO and the ESCO authority um, to take energy, which is the large bulk of the whole cost of an ESCO package anyway, is that energy block. But then there are these other auxiliary costs and other pieces associated to the ESCO service. So uh, if we have the ability to you know, sleeve an ESCO or rather a wholesale um, supply contract on this uh, firming contract with our vendor, uh, we could perhaps be opening up a door uh, to even more competitive pricing by going and getting in directly into the uh, wholesale market. And you know, at the very least, we're getting a peek under the hood. We're seeing more about how the, the market operates and understanding more about the directions we can go with that. So. What that would look like, um, you know, in theory, on a, on a first go around as we develop this, uh, we we could still run our traditional retail ESCO auction. So, you know, we talk to the same players, do things as we have done in the past, um, and then we'd also run a wholesale auction on the same day. And then folks who were or, or entities that are interested in in bidding just on the wholesale block will come, and that'll, in theory, bring more energy suppliers into the mix here to bid on that energy block in particular. And then we can compare. We know what our costs would be. Um, they'd be fixed and known for that sleeving service from our uh, vendor provider. So we could analyze our full ESCO bids that we get from the normal auction and then also compare you know, what pricing we're getting from the wholesale auction, adding in the cost for uh, the vendor services and then select what the best option is there. So we think this will actually bring a lot of value to um, you know, what we're doing here. And, and adding a, a lot of cost competition to what we're uh, servicing. So, you know, we've never done it before. It's something we're looking to do. Maybe, you know, there's a chance it doesn't, it doesn't add much value. And still the best offers we get are on the, uh, you know, retail ESCO side, but at least, you know, we are doing some things that are moving us in a direction um, to become a little bit more dynamic and understand the market a bit more. So what that brings us to here is, is a proposal we have about uh, going for a five-month extension on the current contract that we have with Constellation New Energy. So um, I'll also mention, you know, again, there's this market volatility out there. So what that has caused is, is a lot of unknown for suppliers and providers. So there's a price that's fixed into the indicatives and what we see in the market with uncertainty. There's, there's you know, that's, that's costed into the, these prices right now. Um, and so, you know, hopefully with an extension, in addition to allowing time for us to set up this uh, new system and try to run this new auction and get, get off the ground with that and um, on the path of all these things we just talked about, um, we can also maybe kind of weather the storm on what's going on in the market and have, uh, you know, a little bit more of a stable situation with pricing in the market when we get through five months. So that's what we're proposing here, uh, sort of our two main uh, points about wanting to do an extension. So the timeline for that right now, um, 
you know, I, I mentioned to the supervisor, uh, Dan Welsh, the director of the program, sent some information out priming people to the supervisors and administrators about what we're offering here, everything I just talked at length about, and um, proposing a, a meeting to kind of sift through all the details, deal with issues, and um, put us on a target to, uh, you know, agree upon an MOU price. So right now we're working with constant going to be working with Constellation, getting those indicatives, figuring out where the market's at and what we can get a contract extension for. It's not going to be these great rates we have now because that's out of line with where the market is, unfortunately. So um, we will be having to get a new price to can, uh, a new, a new um, price not to exceed. And then that means we have to go through this whole compliance uh, again, since the price is changing and do a mailing. So um, that means we'll hopefully, and we're in a tight constricted timeline right now. So hopefully participation, we can get all the, the municipalities to authorize board signed on by early mid-April, uh, sign co contracts with Constellation uh, immediately after that. And then again, we go through the mailing and doing an opt out. So residents, biz, small business owners will get those letters, letting them know what the new terms are and that it's a five month thing, et cetera. And then we'll go July 1 with the extension. And then on the right side here, the timeline for a new contract where we'll be immediately working on getting that all ironed out and moving forward and then hopefully by September, November, locking into a long-term contract. That's hopefully you know really awesome for the program and everybody to participate. So uh, I threw a lot at you. I don't know if I use more than my time, so I'm sorry about that. I can't, but um, I'll, I'll stop there and answer questions. Hey, thank you, Nick. That was great. Um, very detailed explanation of um, Westchester Power and CCA, and we appreciate that and um, all of the good work that uh, Sustainable is doing to keep us, uh, or Westchester Power is doing to keep us uh, as close to uh, those good rates as possible. Um, we know that they're definitely not gonna be lasting beyond the contract um, at this point in time, but hopefully, um, you know, we can get to some balanced situation. Um, do any of my board colleagues have any questions for Nick about the CCA, about sustainable Westchester, um, the contracts moving forward, the MOU that we're going to be required to sign, or the updated the adjustment to the to add the solar credit? Um, I'd like to be able to see everybody, but um, I the stop sharing the screen for a second. So. Oh, the opt-out is for the municipality, or is that take away the option for any one of our residents to opt out if they so choose? Oh. Say it over time, I'm sorry. The opt-out is for people to be able to, like, in other words, I think, are we talking about the so, I mean, at the end of that, at the end of that last slide, you, it was, you know, we're going to be signing the memorandum, or we're going to be, you know, and then at the end it said, you know, the end of the opt-out period. Does that mean for us right. to opt out of the whole program or for our residents to be able to opt out of the program? Yeah, Sorry, what's a notice about the new contract terms for individual account holders to opt out if they don't like the sound of the new terms, they can get out and, you know, before that launches, they can still opt out anytime, even if they don't do it in the opt out period, but that's just an initial phase that they have the opportunity to opt out before the new rates kick in. Otherwise, you know, they could just come back the next month and do it. So if, if Austining didn't want to participate, you wouldn't sign the MOU in the first right. place. You know? Okay, perfect, thank you. I have one question too. Hi, Nick, thanks for the presentation, great. Uh, just wondering, what is our potential potential electric customers and how many people opted out last year? Ooh, I should have awesome numbers. Let me see, I think I do actually in a tab. Give if me not, one. you could always email it later, no big deal, I just would like to see. Yeah, I don't have the opt out rate uh, in front of me for sure, but I can tell you the count numbers. Yeah, just to know how far off we are as far as people not signing it up for it. Yeah. Well, so, say there's a, what, was it 147,000 out of a million residents? And, and well, I mean, that's, a, I guess. Well, there was 29 total municipalities right, and right, 147 right. residents. Or, yeah, it's not so. a lot. It's not, not yeah. a lot of people are in it. It, it. We should, it should be much more. Yeah. And also, I think maybe on the bill, where do you find what they have? Because some customers, maybe some residents don't know what they have. Yeah. Is, and where would they look for that? Yeah, on the electricity supply section of their Con Edison bill. So it's the second page, I think, when they get into the breakdowns of the electric and gas and it should be in the top left. And underneath the breakout of all the charges and the total, it'll say, it'll look like you have an ESCO to say Constellation New Energy. 
but underneath that it'll say you know hey you're part of sustainable westchester's westchester power program based on amount fisco there's the contact info and, and that would be the indication along with our rate our fixed rate uh, that they're in the program so um, it would be pretty clear if they looked in that section and read through it whether they were in the program or not it would just okay. state it. Uh, name. so uh i am seeing austin town 12 uh you know a little over what is this oh almost 1300 participants in the oh, program okay. Um, so that's between the renewable and the standard. So 21 people actually participate in the standard, and then the other 1254 are in the renewable. And then actually, there's um, 100 and almost 50 small commercial accounts. Um, Good. No, that's not correct. 76. 76. So close. Very close. Yeah, very close. I was adding two months together. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. one drop village... off from from December to January. So. Thank you. Nick. Yeah, somebody up. It looked like there was one opt out from the small commercial grouping from December to January. They're going to be regretting so, that. 77 to 76. I would think they would be regretting that now. Maybe. Uh, yeah. They might have closed shop. Who knows? But yeah. Christy, did you have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. You scratched your head. <laughs> so okay. um, How many do the village have? Do you have that in front of you now? Village? Or not really? Yeah, you, uh, that'll just take me a second. I haven't added the village numbers up, but uh, if, if you have That's two okay. minutes, I can do it. That's all right. It's yeah. Okay. It's fine. It's, it's I mean, I'm happy to follow up with it. My my email. I'll just chat it to you right now. You can ask me. You can. Or do I have compatibility in the way? No, okay. I can't. There's no chat. It's nick at sustainablewestchester.org. Pretty easy. So okay. uh, yeah, it wouldn't be hard to. I should know that I'm a village resident. I don't know why that's not just in my brain. But. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, anybody else have any questions? I mean, again, I think right now it's a great time to opt in if you haven't, um, and you can get the fixed rate that's being offered. It's only through June, but save you a couple bucks till then. And um, you know, we're not always on the bottom side of that graph sometimes we're a little bit above and there there was a period of time like over a year i think that rates were a little bit higher um again the best thing in my opinion about this is driving demand um when we aggregate all of the customers who are in the program um and we're negotiating large amounts of uh energy supply you know we can we can call the shots a little bit more and uh, many of the municipalities do have the um renewable only option, 100% renewable. And that's great because it really does send a message to our um, energy suppliers that we need more renewable energy um, as part of the grid. So that's that's an exciting part of it. And then of course, you know, the impact on the environment is, is, is good based on our community um, aggregated power, um, and as and also as mentioned, um, obviously the price is nice right now. So for all those reasons, um, we are I think looking forward to most likely sign on the dotted line next time. Obviously, we're going to have to see how the negotiations go, but uh, I think we have to do that in advance. And um, it's always tricky and interesting. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens um, if we are able to do this. Um, uh, wholesale act as a, you know a wholesale purchaser instead of uh, like you know just purchasing from an ESCO, and we'll see what happens. Um, but it should it should be interesting. I'm always looking for new new opportunities to uh, do better. Yeah, absolutely. We're excited about it. Five thousand village residents, almost. Just there, to, uh, thank you, Nick. Yeah, no problem. I'm sure you're one of them. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, if there's no more questions, I think we're going to say thank you, and we will be hearing from you for whatever the needs are, and also we would very much be interested in that, you know, the solar credit um, program and what we need to do with our local law um, to amend it. Okay, yeah. Um, okay. I'll make sure to pass that info along to the solar team and make sure we get it in your hands. No. All right, wonderful. Did I did I miss any of my board colleagues? Are you good? Everybody. Nope. Thank you. Thanks again.
All right, take care. Thank you. So next up, we have the wonderful our comptroller, Dale Brennan, who is here and joined by our deputy comptroller, Elizabeth Nakari. And we are going to hear a departmental report um, to hear a little bit about how our books are looking as we are looking to close out 2021 fiscal year. Ms. Mm -hmm. Brennan, take it away. Ah, thank you, town supervisor. Uh, good evening, town board. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Victoria to pull up um, the first schedule onto the screen, um, which is our uh, mortgage tax revenues uh, okay. to, to kick it off. Um, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants because I cannot log on to my computer at work. So <laughs> this is going to be a, <clears throat> a from, from the memory, so to speak. Um, so every... Um, Every year in, in two installments, the town receives um, mortgage tax revenues um, based on uh, sales and refinances. And as we know for 2021, the market was definitely hot and that is reflected uh, in our received amount. So uh, for the 2021 year, we had budgeted uh, between the general fund and then a small portion goes to the TOB fund. Um, $546,281. We actually received uh, $1,045,648.56, um, which gave us uh, $499,367 over our budget amount. Um, the portion of that that was general fund was actually $421,000. Uh, so that was helpful. Uh, to the general fund um, to offset. Uh, we had a small, well, not quite small, about 220,000 uh, that we had to reduce our tax revenues by uh, in order to feed the liability for uh, allowance for uncollected taxes. Um, so this helped to, to offset uh, that change uh, in the revenue line. Uh, if we go to the next uh, schedule, which is sales tax revenue. So definitely uh, an upswing from uh, 2020. We kept the budget the same uh, for 2021, um, budgeting 750,000 and receiving 1,320. Uh, so the excess over budget was 570,000. So sales tax revenue, uh, all of that revenue goes to the uh, town unincorporated fund. Um, so that helps uh, offset costs that were not anticipated or revenues that didn't materialize. Um, and uh, Anything extra will go back to fund balance, which uh, brings us to the next schedule, Victoria. Okay. So for presentation purposes, I probably shouldn't have kept all those years on there. <laughs> are, are you able to zoom in to the, the, the right side more, Victoria? Uh, but then we lose our funds. Um, but I'll, I'll speak to, to the funds. Um, so essentially fund balance is uh, what occurs at the end of the year, uh, taking the prior year um, ending balance. It will then um, add revenues and then deduct expenditures to give you a new fund balance number at the end of the year. Uh, so if you look at the 2021 column and the 2020, at the end of 2020 for the general fund, we had $3.433 million. Uh, we were able to uh, add to the fund balance $706,000. Uh, what made that uh, materialize were our revenue uh, amounts uh, coming in were 400,000 over the budget amount and our expenditures uh, were under uh, the budget amount by 300,000. 
so that essentially then goes back uh, to fund balance um, to support the town going forward. Sometimes we'll use it for special projects. Uh, we like to not use it towards filling a budget gap um, because eventually if you rely on that, then it, it runs out. Um, so we do use it for uh, project specific. In 2021, uh, we had budgeted 130,000 of fund balance for uh, the kitchen at the nutrition center. And then uh, last week, I think it was last week, uh, you approved a, a budget adjustment to fund um, 6,000 toward one of the uh, parks projects. Um, so those amounts came off of out of fund balance. So if you go to the, the next fund is the town uh, unincorporated fund. Uh, so similar uh, situation there. Our revenues were more than our expenditures. So we're able to put uh, a little over 400,000 uh, to fund balance. And the highway fund, um, same scenario uh, with 222,000. Uh, we did have a slight reduction of fund balance in our consolidated sewer fund um, due to uh, <clears throat> revenues not materializing yet for um, uh, one of the IBM sewer IMAs, which uh, hopefully we can sort out in the coming year. We did use a small amount from uh, refuse and recycling $465. And then as the board had approved for the ambulance district, uh, we originally had anticipated using 50,000 of fund balance um, to help with uh, the COVID vaccinations. Um, at the end of the day, when revenues and expenditures uh, came to their hopefully true numbers, we haven't been audited yet, um, we only used 32,259. So any questions? And I can certainly email those uh, schedules to the board since it was kind of hard to see that yeah. last and take a closer Sorry. look at it. We have in, <laughs> we, we, we in Wi-Fi land. A, we, we could cut <laughs> off a few years. Um, yeah, Dale, I was just wondering. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Dale, I was yeah. just wondering why is this the mortgage tax and the sales tax go from like May, June to December or where is January? That's they, they remit um, either quarterly or uh, twice, year. twice a year. So okay. that, that's when the check actually um, arrives. So Understood. Uh, that's, Thank you. yes, sure. Okay. No. You're muted. Thank you as always. For your Thank thorough you, watching over our funds and think oh. you did okay. I was muted. Okay, so I was saying <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? You guys already answered the question. There were no other questions. Um, yes, thank you so much. It's um, it's great to see that um, we are continuing to um, spend less and bring in more revenue. Obviously, um, some of these things are really outside our control: sales tax and um, you know mortgage recording tax. But excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Hey, shoo! Bless what? you. Sorry about that. Uh, excuse what? me. Thank you. Um, so, uh, but it's it's good news, and we always do budget very conservatively for our revenues, which is another. Um, you know, I think we've done that for the last few years, even though we knew that the um, sales tax was likely growing, especially then we had COVID, so we didn't know what was happening with the market, and you know, people were going to keep people going to be spending money or not, and all of these things are volatile. So for us to continue to budget uh, conservatively on the revenue side, um, as well as on the expenditure side, um, is uh, is the best way to ensure that we will have a healthy fund balance and healthy fund balance also helps with our um, bond ratings. Um, and you know, we did manage to get a better rate, a Moody's rating a couple of years ago, um, which helps when we do wanna go out to borrow, we do anticipate um, wanting to do that uh, this year, a little bit later in the year, for some of our bigger uh, capital projects um, that we know that we're going to have to undertake to maintain our infrastructure and our parks and um, outdoor spaces. So 
thanks again, um, Comptroller Brennan, <laughs> for uh, a great um, report, which makes us happy. And um, we'll uh, hopefully get that IBM bill paid and uh, sorted out in the near and not too distant future. So, yeah. and a thank you. To one more quick question. Um, thank you to Liz, book? too. Okay. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> where does the bulk of our uh, sales tax come from? Um, somebody asked me this high? question. This question before, <laughs> and, I, and I go back to when when I had seen um, uh, um, like an analysis of where sales tax comes from, um, and essentially, it, it in terms of how we get it, it's proportion per population. But the biggest um, contributor to sales tax is actually uh, automobiles. Okay. I'm always excited to say that answer because it, it always struck me as <laughs> who would think, right? You know, but well, that's... And also, also now I think, right, they, they changed the law for um, online sales tax so that you're, wherever mm -hmm. you're buying from, it's coming back to the county. Right. Um, you know, right. That was county. somewhat recent change. Right. So, and the county also increased, the, the county did increase right. um, its um, sales tax by what, 0.1, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, that happened, and that's that's also you know had an impact. I do think everybody is looking at the gas tax, and the state and county both um, you know play a part in that. In addition to the having a federal gas tax, um, there I know there's some conversations about capping or um, eliminating the the tax while we see this volatility um, in the market. Um, so I, I think that you know there's some legislation that's been introduced um, that we will be hearing more about in the not too distant future um, at state level. I'm not sure about the county, but um, and I don't know if uh, uh, Councilman Meyer, if you have any more information about that that you want to add, or if it's all just kind of up in the air right now. I know there's there's pros and cons to addressing the gas tax um, in a in, in that in sort of a way right now, you know, making sort of adjustments to it, because obviously, um, you know, we count on it to offset the, you know, the cost of doing business, uh, government business, but they, you know, if it, as it goes up proportionately with the price of gas, it, it's certainly making it more and more difficult for people to make ends meet we are hoping that we will be less and less reliant on fossil fuels, <laughs> which would be um, the best thing. And, you know, maybe consider buying electric next time. I'm sorry, uh, Councilman Minicchio, but I'm hoping that you're going to install an a, um, electric power station soon, uh, you know, an EV charging station soon, because uh, we, need, we need one at your place. It's, good, it's a good location. Good. So, but just, so, just to tell you, it is about 62 cents on a gallon of gas. And there's six taxes between three for federal and three for state. And that's what it comes up well, with the 62 I there was also county, not county also? That's no, on our, usually on the gas station bills, there's usually three federal and three state. And then there's a prepaid tax that they charge. But that all accumulates about 62 cents on a gallon of gas. Thank you for that. And I don't know, Councilman Meyer, anything to add about uh, anything the state is considering doing about those three separate uh, gas taxes? Yeah, the state, I, I think there's a high likelihood the state is going to put a moratorium on the state tax of gasoline. Um, I think the dates would be May 1st to December 31st. Um, not final yet, it'll be in the state budget, but I think there's a high likelihood of that. Um, and then there was, Angela, I guess you, you know more about this than me, but I, there was uh, something being discussed that would give municipalities an opt out on their share of the sales tax so i don't know exactly what that would yeah mean. i think what's going to happen would just have to apply back to the state for reimbursement so i think that's the process that because they did this in the past when the prices were high that you would have to pay for it ahead of time and then get reimbursed as a municipality so if that probably would be the same issue again hmm. Interesting. okay well good for thought for future meetings and what we can do to help the people at the pump Solar, solar, no, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, 
we know we we do know that that's that's a, that certainly a large part of the problem. So it's a joke, but not that big a joke. Um, okay. So anyhow, speaking of the environment, um, if I think we might be done with um, with Dale and Liz, and thank you very much for joining us this evening, and um, on to a discussion about balloon legislation. Uh, we know how tempting it is to send things off into the sky or into what seems like the vast Hudson River. It looks so pretty, especially when we are wanting to commemorate or celebrate or memorialize loved ones or events. However, uh, these things that we send off, balloons, lanterns, candles, I don't know everything, it seems, eventually it come down or fall down. Um, and litter our earth and our river and our waterways. Uh, Councilwoman Feldman has been doing a lot of research on how local governments and even states across the county, a country discourage balloon releases um, and other types of releases, especially along waterfronts as they are detrimental to the environment. So I'm going to turn it over to Councilwoman Feldman who is now our resident balloon release expert to share with us her research, and uh, we also are joined by Susie Ross from Sustainable Westchester, who may want to add in some of what she's learned. Um, and then we'll have a little bit more of a discussion about what we might want to do moving forward. Councilman Feldman, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Supervisor. Anyway, uh, balloon litter has been a pet peeve of mine for quite a while now. Um, every time I'm out on the boat, we have to stop at least once to pull them out of the river. Those of you that have been a passenger on my boat knows that this is expected of you. You know, if you see a balloon, it's your job to go pick it up. Um, I guess some people just don't realize how deadly the balloon litter is to the fish, the turtles, the aquatic mammals, and the birds. And the ribbons uh, attached to them also do a lot of damage, not only to um, the wildlife that can see it as food, but also to power lines and other uh, things. So, I mean, people just don't seem to realize that, you know, when you let it go, whether it goes up or down, it's still littering. So I believe it's time for us to do a public education campaign about alternative ways to celebrate or commemorate occasions um, without incurring the damage that balloon waste causes our environment. And I also believe it's time to put in place a ban on the releasing of any balloons in our community with a few uh, exceptions, you know, scientific research and the like. You know, I think we should start with this statement Something like, uh, although the town board or the town of Austin recognizes that balloon releases are common ways to celebrate or memorialize occasions or people, we believe it goes against the town policy of not littering, protecting our environment, and being good stewards of our Hudson River. And we should go from there. Um, and there are a lot of things to be considered. So I know a lot of municipalities consider the types of balloons. Um, I'm I don't think there are any real biodegradable balloons that go away before they're a hazard. So I, I believe we shouldn't have any. There are um, other things that we may want to consider banning separately, the Chinese lanterns, doves, butterflies, none of these are good ideas. Um, anyway, there's a lot that goes into it, but basically I think we should have a ban on releasing any sort of balloon into the environment. And it's pretty simple in my mind. So thoughts and discussion. Uh, well, uh, I, I'll certainly say that I think that um, we do need to put something in place because we are seeing more and more uh, people coming to our waterfront in particular, um, looking at it as a, as a place to throw something. I, Councilman Feldman, you do have to tell your tell me say your favorite quote that you always say to everybody. Oh right, when you let them go, they really don't go to heaven. <laughs> they don't actually go to heaven. They do land eventually and somewhere. <laughs> he tells yeah. us, he tells us to a lot of people, which I find very. Um, <laughs> you know, they don't actually go to heaven, right? Like you know, yes. you you could find a better way, <laughs> which I really do like. Um, anyway. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to take credit for that because it was too, it's so good, but it is true. Um, I think, you know, again, I think people, um, you know, don't do this with any bad intentions. Um, they do it again because it seems like it's a release 
um, in many ways, an emotional release. Um, and it's, um, it's a difficult time for people often when they're doing this, because um, a lot of times it's, it's really to memorialize more than anything. I think that those are the types of things that we see. Um, and those are the hardest, probably hardest times when we have to uh, talk with people. But people often do call our offices, either the village or town office, to ask about it. Oh, may I, may I do this? Do I need to you know, get a permit for this? What, what do I need to do? And, and we don't really have anything to give them guidance right now. Uh, I think you know, it makes sense for us to come up with a plan to give guidance. Um, I do wonder about you know, what, what, what this might look like if it were, in fact, a local law versus some kind of a policy or, or, or some sort of a resolution. Um, just like many of our uh, well-intentioned um, local laws, you know, we don't want it to end up being something that's, that makes it difficult for, creates difficult situations for people. But it's certainly an opportunity for us to figure out how, um, you know, to move forward in terms of signage, education, and, um, you know, really letting people know that this is something that, um, as a town that we believe isn't something that people should be doing. Um, so again, I think that there's a number of different um, things that we should consider. And I think our council um, has given us a, a little bit of a guide, guidance sheet for us to think about the different pieces that might go into either a town law or policy and um, go from there. I, I'm curious to hear from our other um, town council members how you feel about this. One quick thing. Um... I also want to have a booth at the Green Ossining Festival, uh, Earth Day Festival, that shows alternate options. So there are several options, you know, rather than balloons, you can have a candle, you can have this wish paper that you, you know, light and it floats, you know, very short distance. You can have streamers instead of balloons that don't actually float up into the air and can be collected easily. You can uh, use bubbles. There are a lot of different things that you can do that that aren't as bad for the environment or bad for the environment at all. So I think we having a public edu education campaign in conjunction um, with, I mean, to me, balloon releases a littering. So I, I think it should be in that section, but anyway, con sorry, continue. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great, great thing to take on, um, particularly with our, location right on the Hudson River. Um, so anything I could do to support, I'm, I'm all for it. Okay. And Councilman Minichio, where are you? Well, like myself, I think the education process is good. I mean, whoever knew that balloons could cause all this. Thank you, Councilman Feldman, for bringing me up to speed with that. You know, you see it firsthand on the, on the river there. Uh, just, I want to protect the people that, you know, graduations are big balloon things and they don't intend to release them, but say they want goals, you know, just talk about it. Let's see what we come up with good ideas. And I think education will go a big part in this. So I, I'm in for it too. And we have Susie Ross, uh, before we continue our conversation, did you want to add anything to this? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm thrilled, Liz. Thank you so much for being a champion behind this. I think you've done a lot of research. I think there are a lot of options out there. Um, a public service campaign is, is, is important. Signage is gonna be important too. I do think that we uh, get Riverkeeper to get behind this as well. And I think it says a lot about our community to be forward thinking about something that not every river town is thinking about. Um, and I, I feel like there's a great opportunity here for um, this to be adopted by other communities with Ossining leading the way. Um, there are, there was a, a balloon release um, over the past year. I think that really was one of the reasons that Liz and I had started talking about various different options. And so on one side of you know, the coin, you're thinking about balloon releases and what they do to the environment. And we know, we know that if, you're, if you've looked at any of the research um, or if you've listened or seen anything you know, in, in terms of the real effects when you're collecting them on the top of the river um, or up a, you know, around the shoreline when we do the sweep every year. Um, but there is actually something far better than that, as we know, some of the things that we found like 
planting seed cards or having an area perhaps, perhaps because the shoreline is so important to our community when it comes to celebrations. Um, perhaps there could be things along Engle Park where we might have an area where people can memorialize situations with seed cards. Um, it might be something you might consider giving out on Earth Day if this is when you want to actually make a statement about this new law, perhaps. Um, and those seed cards can be planted anywhere. They don't all have to be at the river, but it's a way to actually for people to write something down, plant something and have it be far longer lasting than a balloon release. So um, we're, you know, we're happy to help with any outreach and any um, promotion about this. And again, I do seriously applaud the town for taking this on and, and because it really is not something that, I mean, I think, Liz, in your research, it's not something that we've seen any municipality really up and down the Hudson take on. Um, I don't know if any have. So um, I'm always pretty proud of, of Austin when we are able to be the first out at things like this. It's, it's bold, but I think it's really important. And I think with education and options, this should be you know, a very quick win. In the conversations I've had with um, both Austin and Burke with mayors, they uh, village mayors. They are interested in joining us as uh, is the county. And uh, I saw our county executive uh, at a function the other day, and he said that Casper had brought it um, back to the table and that he would absolutely sign it um, if and when it gets to him. So I think we may have the county uh, joining us in this, and that would be great. That'd be really great. But first steps. So I don't know if we wanted to turn it over to Council Tamadana uh, to just take us through um, maybe what it would take to put together either a policy or a local law. Um, but I know that you had some some items for consideration. Are we um, talking about banning just balloons or also other items like Chinese lanterns, doves, and butterflies? Is that something we're banning the release of? Or I mean, I'm not exactly sure. Are we just gonna stay focused on balloons for this particular local law? Um, and that would be something for us to consider. I'm not exactly sure about the dubs and butterflies, how that all works. Maybe I missed that. Yeah, if anything, I'd put the, the Chinese lanterns in with this law if possible, um, or separately just because of the fire hazard they present. Um, that's a thing. I, I'd agree with that. If I could say anything that we are, we're basically tossing things into the environment and not having any idea where they end up landing. So it's going to be garbage somewhere. And to me, that's a detriment to the environment. I think we should have, if we're going to do something like this, the balloon releases obviously are probably done much more frequently, perhaps where we live than they are in other communities. Maybe, um, I don't know. Um, the doves and the butterflies, I, I don't think I've ever seen that happen, but I, I think that anytime we're just taking something that naturally doesn't occur and releasing it into the environment, and we have no idea where it ends up, um, I just, I think we should be treating the environment and nature with a lot more respect than that. So um, I'd say go for it, just toss it all in. No releases of any kind, period. Let's plant things. Yeah, of course, not, not in, non-invasive things. <laughs> um, I mean, a release. I don't. I, I mean, I get it's a little complicated. Like, what's a release? And I don't. Christy, do you want to? Well, and that's yeah. I mean, so what I prepared for the board that I circulated last week is um, I took all of the great information that um, Councilwoman Feldman had circulated, and I I went through it and tried to kind of identify some themes or concepts. Um, that were common in all of the different laws from all different levels of government around the country. Um, because, you know, for, whether it's a policy or a law, um, I think that may factor into how the board wants to approach this. Um, so that may be, you know, a preliminary step because um, as the supervisor was saying, and one of my suggestions at the end of my list was um, to see if the police chief would have any thoughts or input on this because 
um, enforcement is going to be the challenge with something like this. So whether you decide try to do it as a policy um, or for guidance and education purposes, like we discussed, versus a law may also influence how the law is drafted or how the board feels about it. So um, that may not be the case, but that's just kind of my perspective on it. Okay. I mean, some of the things and some of the laws that made sense to me, um, let's see, a balloon release for scientific or meteorological purposes uh, on behalf of a government agency or pursuant to a government contract, a hot air balloon, or one that is released and remains indoors. And one of the ones I liked was um, an accidental release by somebody 13 years of age or younger, or an accidental release. Um, all are, you know, as, except, as exceptions to the prohibition. As exceptions to the prohibition. I read the New York state law, proposed law, and that went a little far. I mean, I would put it into um, probably a littering penalty and not have, you know, per balloon. Some of them go per balloon and they really get kind of crazy. But I mean, I'm sure we can- Right, come now, up with that was in the, <clears throat> the enforcement discussion. Um, if it were to be a law, um, should there be a warning first? Um, I mean, in, in practicality, that's probably going to be what happens. Yeah. Um, and, and we've seen that with other types of um, laws that the town's put in place is um, instead of giving people policy, uh, tickets right off the bat. It's more about informing them what the law is and, and giving them an opportunity to comply. Um, and then obviously if it's going to be a law, you would need to, to designate what the penalties are going to be. Um, I, I agree with you, but obviously it's up to the town board um, <clears throat> as to whether, you know, if you release 50 balloons at one time, is that considered one offense or 50 offenses? Because that, that really factor into you know what the penalties would be within the terms of reasonableness. And I have a question about that too, because like <clears throat> I have 50 people and all of them are releasing one balloon. How does that work? Is it a uh, yeah, I, is there, is there, is there one, goes up. <laughs> well, is it a coordinated release if everybody just releases one? I mean, one of the things is, you know, some, some, some of the laws did have numbers. I mean, you could say one, but, you know, obviously an accidental release, but everybody could come with it tied around the wrist and then just kind of, I'm just, I'm just like playing devil's advocate for a second. Just like, you know what I mean? Like there's people would find, can find ways around stuff. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. you can't people help. find ways, yeah, people find ways around, around, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. around everything. I think at least if there, it's known that Austin has a law, you know, at least a policy, preferably a law in yeah. my view, um, then maybe they'll plan something else, you know, and, and it will become known that this isn't a community that looks favorably on that. And, you know, maybe we'll work toward a greener solution. But I, but I think too, if I might add that, that if you have the education out in front of this, that over time, it's not, um, it's not something that's, that people will be like, oops, I didn't know. I mean, of course, there's always going to be people that are not paying attention to the messaging out there, whether it's on social media or web blasts or anything. Most people don't even know the laws of the town or the village unless they happen to come upon them because they did something wrong or somebody they know did something wrong. Right, but, but I think people, sometimes people come to us to do these things, like which is perfect. Local, you know what I mean? They're not right. Local. As long as we no, have. No, no, I didn't mean. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean they. I, I, I said that wrong. They come to Austin because they want to release, maybe they grew up here, maybe somebody that passed away was from here, but they're not. So a lot of times, like as much education as you can do locally, it's not going to reach the people who, you know, you need to reach. Um, Cause you know, it's not always people just from Austin who do these things. You mentioned signage though. Didn't you mention yes. signage? I did. So if you have signage, signage referencing the law or, you know, the, the signage actually indicates that there's some alternatives that we'd recommend, um, you know, if they brought a, you know, 50 balloons with them and they looked at the sign, probably, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to what will happen with those 50 balloons. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to get everybody to adopt to it right away. And we may not get everyone to adopt to it entirely, but I think we can stop most of it. And that's significant. Yeah, even a few hundred less balloons, you know, a few hundred less dead, you know, animals would be nice. 
Yes. And I'm really sick of seeing them in the trees. They're everywhere. So, so the, I guess one of the other issues that I had identified was um, the locations where um, where this should be prohibited and the sense I'm getting from the discussion was that it would be town-wide. That's my so. mind. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also just want to note, because Councilwoman Feldman, when you mentioned the balloons and trees, I'm wondering if some of that has to do with people who are renting um, some of the spaces in our parks and holding parties and maybe, you know, not securing it properly or forgetting to, you know, I say forgetting, forgetting to bring them with them when they're done with their party. So maybe that's something that we can also ask our recreation superintendent to include as part of the uh, pavilion rental application or something like that, even, you know, separate and apart from all of this, just reminding people that if you it's if you're at this party, you, you hold a party, remember to bring your garbage with you, bring your balloons with you, make sure you're outside. So keep your balloons secured. That's something that we can probably share, um, you know, just in advance of the season starting. Yeah. Good idea. So do you want to that actually, sorry, that goes to another point that I had identified is that some of the laws um, in other states and municipalities uh, went beyond just the release to the actual sale or use of balloons um, to for, you know, but, but that creates, you know, a, an issue yeah. like Gloria was saying where, um, you know, people are having a party or they want to identify that they're going to be in a specific area for a party um, that that may be a step too far if the board thinks so but that that was just another thing that i had seen in the in the laws that that, that i needed some guidance on personally I, I don't think we should go to the sale yeah. balloons. even though I, I, I i'm opposed to balloons i i don't think that's what we're trying to take on right now i think we're taking on the issue of of litter uh in our uh parks and public spaces and our uh you know natural environment that we don't want to uh contaminate so I think uh, to, to your question, um, Christy, I, I think we don't need to get into the sale and use. I think we're just talking about release. Um, I don't think we even wanna put a number to it personally. I think we could ex you know, have an exclusion for somebody um, under the age of 13, obviously accidents happen. Um, and I don't think anybody's gonna go chasing kids around who you know, lost a balloon from their arm. Um, I mean, we can certainly tell, you know, we can say we discourage them being used for events large events, um, because that's oftentimes when these things happen. So, you know, that's something we can certainly say. Um, uh, I think we should absolutely include the exception for the scientific purposes, manned hot air balloons, or et cetera, um, and those remaining indoors. Um, and I think the characteristics that are described in most of the, those laws were similar, that filled with gas later than air, um, or constructed of electrically conductive material made of non-biodegradable material. Well, I don't think we ever want to include that. Um, I think mostly it's, we don't want people releasing balloons into the air that are going to pretend to go to heaven. Yeah, and I would, I, I would be careful about making the distinction too about how, what the balloons are made out of. There is actually yeah. Somebody that opened up shop somewhere that said that they make biodegradable balloons. Yeah, right. Can't and well. somehow that's supposed to make us feel better, but there, there's not really any such thing as we don't know of those things. But um, yeah. Yeah, they don't degrade before something has already eaten it, you know, or, or it's become a hazard. Right. So we don't want to include that. We're just no. seeing balloons with, depending on what they're filled with, and that's it. I'm fine with just releasing balloons. I don't like them when they float into on top of the river with or, with air or anything else, but that's just me. Do people release balloons that don't have helium or something in them? Not on purpose. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is that you, you need some sort of intent here. Um, I so think didn't, didn't Councilman Plumman have that opening paragraph? She just read. No, I mean, like, like, um, intent to, to break the law. Oh, um, oh, I see. Oh, right. No, not the like accidental that. release is not actionable regardless. Right. All 
Are we doing anything about water balloons? Or is that included in the, what it's filled with? It's not really. Um, it's that's not a very good point though. I mean, maybe, I don't wanna complicate matters, but you know, I mean, balloon fights, it's a great summer thing to do on the river in that little patch of picnic -y area that people, you know, have, have barbecues at and everything. I, I don't know if there's a way to just integrate the um, avoidance of usage of balloons, period, by the river. I mean, what you're doing here is you're raising awareness at the environmental um, impact. You're not doing it directly by just having a law, but you are for anybody that we educate about it. Um, and so what we do want to do um, is to avoid any situation where people may be putting any type of trash into the river, cigarette butts. I mean, these are the types of things that we see every cleanup. It's cigarette butts, it's plastic bags. Um, <clears throat> the state's obviously helped us with plastic bags, but that for years has was been, you know, is one of the number one things that we would clean up. And we still see them floating in trees now because we can't avoid all of them. But um, I think particularly at the river, um, and you could say that for any area within uh, Ossining in the town that has wetlands that run into, you know, the estuaries that run into the Hudson River, we still see all kinds of trash. So I think that if you can avoid, um, if you can, if you can somehow or another make it so that it is not lawful to have that type of um, material down at the river, just balloons of any kind down at the river. I just think I feel that um, even though I agree with you about all those things um, that we're trying to do too much in one fell swoop, um, I think we should try to keep this focused on what our particular issue is, which isn't all litter. I mean, that is taken up in our littering, um, you know, which theoretically, if you throw a water balloon at somebody and it, and it breaks and then it leaves the remains of the balloon and you leave that there, that's littering. Right, but what we're talking about in this particular instance is releasing of things that memorialize or celebrate, and getting into this whole water balloon issue is kind of going in a different direction from what the intent, in my opinion, is of of this, which is talking specifically about when people release these things to either celebrate or memorialize. Um, and I, I just think it's complicating it um, in a way that yeah. is going to help our, our goal. Fair enough. Uh, and I'm not, again, again, I don't disagree with you that I all know. of these things are, but so, so we should tell people that they can't go with disposable cups or bottles of any kind to the waterfront anymore um, or drink out of a disposable cup because then they might just leave it or, or a bird might grab it out of the garbage and, and drop it someplace else. I mean, I, I'm just saying we can't, we're not going to be able to solve all of the problems of balloons and right. all of the problems of litter in this one local law what we're just trying to do is address the, these releases. I agree then. I agree. Okay. Uh, so is that enough information at this point, Christy, for you to get something together now? I feel like we went through all of the things on your list. So do you want me to just prepare something substantive and then have another discussion about in what format the town board wants to move forward with it. I, I would still recommend um, uh, once we have a draft of something, having the police chief look at it yes. and provide his input as well. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, what I have is it's the release of balloons of any number. We're just focusing on the release. Um, it doesn't matter what it's made of, filled with, um, attached to, anywhere in the town. And in addition to the exceptions, I had identified um, accidental release. Do you want accidental release limited to 13 and under or accidental release for anyone? I say 13 and under. Okay. But the reality is they're gonna get a warning. So, but I'm, I'm, I think we should say 13 and under because 
it kind of indicates like, you know, if you're an adult and it happened, really, you could have, you probably could have made that not happen. But. Agree. And then as far as enforcement, um, you know, if it's a policy, it's moot. Um, it's not an issue. And that's something that if it does go the direction of the law, then um, the town board can discuss um, what you would want to see in, in the range of penalties. And that may all be also be something um, that the, the chief could participate in. What are our current littering penalties is something I would like to know. We have like 200 or 250, is that right? I, I could, Offense. I don't have it up right now. It's okay. I'm sure having it for our next discussion is fine. But. Okay. So we do have something else on our agenda. I think we have enough to get started. And again, I thank you so much, um, Councilman Feldman for doing the research and Susie Ross for joining us this evening. And uh, with that, I think we're going to move on to our next uh, conversation, unless there's anything else, uh, Christy, that you need from us, are you good? I was just pulling up the penalties. Um, and I really just wanna thank everybody for uh, for looking at this and for, you know, making a difference for the, our environment, so. Thank you from the river. Um, I do think that um, whatever you guys do, I, I do think that we could find a partner, by the way, in Riverkeeper in applauding your efforts and, and coordinating anything they can to support you, but we will support you in whatever we have to do in terms of community education, um, you know, anything along those lines, we'd be happy to help with. Excellent, and that that is going to be the critical, critically important, and hopefully, if we can get the word out um, this Earth Day, um, you know, we can get it to people more than just the folks from Austin because we you know we get lots of visitors from all over the place, and um, just to you know make be a little bit of a wake up call for people to think about these issues, um, I think is important because a lot of people, a lot of times, people don't think about them, and again, just do them because it seems nice and don't think about the consequences. Um, did you find that? So the rain, it's a range from a hundred to a thousand per occurrence, um, I, I suppose. So it's basically to a large degree left to the deference of the, the officer or the courts. Um, and I think it, it's probably based to a certain extent upon the range of items that could be at issue um, because it includes um, any sort of improper disposal of garbage. Um, it talks about tin cans, metal rags, boxes, newspapers, rubbish, boxes, barrels, you know, so you, you could be, if it's a piece of paper versus if it's a barrel. A tire, a refrigerator, things right, like that. Right, right. All things we find at Gerlach Park. Okay, um, so I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you guys. I Thank wish I could you. stay on what it, it, you actually have a really nice agenda, all the stuff I'm interested in, but, um, but thanks for giving me a chance to weigh in tonight. And thanks for, for really leading on this. I think it's really, um, it, it, it very much paints a very impressive picture of Austin in terms of environmental advocacy. So I thank you on behalf of all the organizations that fight for the environment and for the river. So thanks again. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Uh, so last week we held our first night of public hearings on the draft comprehensive plan called Sustainable Austin. After hearing from the public, we wanted to come back to the board to discuss the comments we heard last week and discuss next steps with planner, our planner, Valerie Manastra, and our council, Christy Tomadonna. As a quick plug to our audience and anyone viewing this after the fact, the public hearing is very much still open. We encourage members of the public um, to participate, to send in your comments, to attend the next public hearing, um, and to review the draft comprehensive plan online, which is www.sustainableofsane.com. Um, we have continued the public hearing until March 22nd, uh, which is our next town board meeting, and we will be holding um, both in person and virtually that next meeting. So please take some time to review the plan, especially the objectives and strategy section, and either come by yourself 
um, or ring and or ring your friends to the next public meeting and or send your comments um, to us by email. And you can send them to, I believe, tc at townofaustin.com, um, but also there's a way to submit comments through the sustainableaustin.com uh, website. I think it, 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 there's another way that I'll tell you to send comments. Um, I don't know. Victoria. Or also submit them to the clerk's office. Um, is my emailing is S. Donnelly at Town of Yes, the TC um, was down um, recently. We did just check it. It was working from some emails, but not all mails, emails. So we are working okay. on checking that. Yeah, I had a, a resident contact me today saying, why didn't, why did it bounce back? I said, we're working on it. Uh, okay. So with that, um, I would ask the board if there were any particular comments or discussion that you wanted to have on any of the different um, input that we that we received to date, or, or anything that you have to, to to talk about regarding the comp plan. Would it be helpful to kind of um, inform the board as to what the next steps are in terms of revisions? Yeah, I think so. I think that would be great, Christy. So, so the based upon and Valerie chime in. Um, just because I, I the board has heard some comments. Um, I think what the uh, what the plan was, and obviously, if the board feels differently, we can um, certainly adjust it. Was to wait and see if we get any more substantive comments between now and after the public hearing next week on the 22nd and then ask WXY, which is the town's planning consultants to go back and start substantively incorporating the comments that we have received into the current draft uh, to revise it. And then once that is done, it will be brought back to the board for you to take another look at with those additions and to explore if you're comfortable with them uh, the public will also have an opportunity to look at it before um, our recommendation would be that the public hearing have an, uh, the public have another opportunity to look at the revised comp plan before considering closing the public hearing. So just for the board's information, um, there will be another round of edits that that you'll have an opportunity to review. Um, I think that sounds good. I mean, I know that we had a, a robust discussion at our first work session. Um, we've had some very interesting comments come along um, um, as a result of our discussion and also as a result of um, you know, what's in the comp plan, um, some of it about missing middle housing and um, right sizing um, opportunities for us to have um, additional housing in the town um, that fits in with the uh, style and characteristics of, of, the of the types of buildings that we have here. Um, and also supports affordable housing um, and um, mixed uses and things of that nature. So we did talk a bit about that. Um, and I, I believe that the, um, those, some of those comments have already made their way back to our consultants and they've already um, started to look at tweaks that they can make to the comp plan to address some of those comments uh, proactively. So I don't know, Valerie, did you want to say anything else about that? Or did town, anybody from the town board have anything else that they wanted to, to, to add or have concerns about? Um, I just wanted to clarify or say that, you know, as we're looking at density in parts of the town, um, you know, the village, I don't want to end up like, you know, a big city like Yonkers. I think we should really be careful that we don't have it worded where we're open to greater density everywhere. I think that the village is adding a lot of density in our transit court, you know, transit, transit oriented density in our, our transit corridors. And, you know, kind of the reverse of Manhattan where you've got green in the middle and, you know, dense on the outside. I feel like we're kind of dense, you know, at the village and kind of fanning out to more greener areas towards our parks. And I want to make sure it all flows together nicely. And so we have a little bit of everything and we don't end up just one big city or a haphazard. So, you know, the, the planning and the discussions about where we have our density are important to me. Right. So, and I, I think, I think, um, and that's a good segue, Liz. I think one of the things that um, as 
has um, evolved as a part of this public comment period is that really, to some extent, the the concerns that have been raised about this missing middle housing really comes from only one one um, basically one recommendation in the comprehensive plan, and in the comprehensive plan, it doesn't identify areas, it doesn't identify zoning districts, it doesn't even identify parcels. All it's really saying is that if at some point in time the town decides to look at different zoning options or, you know, has some sort of zoning petition or wants to look at, you know, other housing options that consider the missing middle concept. And we're going to make sure as we revise this that it's clear that we're not targeting any particular areas in the in the town. We're not targeting any particular zoning districts. We're just really focusing on this overall concept so that it's kind of focusing, you know, your your overall the characteristics of the community, which is not high density, you know, large scale housing, but more of ones that would fall within the characteristics already existing in the town of Austin. So that's really that's really the main um, cons uh, goal or objective of that particular recommendation, and specifically to allow that kind of flexibility for the town board to make those decisions in the future. Thank you. A lot of sense. Great. Uh, anybody else have any comments? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Well, I, uh, I just all that one thing. Just I'm I would like some more a little bit of public income uh, input. So I've been going around, you know, digesting all this. Uh, I've been educated a lot on the middle of missing housing now, so uh, I feel comfortable with that. But you know, I just had a little more discussion from the public, and I feel once we get this scheduled down as far as public hearing goes and all that, I think they'll have an opportunity to to give everybody in the public a chance to speak in the town. So, so the reason why, <clears throat> excuse me. The reason why I brought that up earlier was just because it, in the context of your substantive discussion, um, I just wanted to make sure that the board understood um, that, that we were still, we are certainly still working our way through that public comment process. And there will be revisions um, to the draft that, that you will have an opportunity to review. And you know, at that time, obviously, um, there will be further opportunity for the town board to, to discuss it internally and with the public. Um, but in terms of timing, legally and procedurally, um, we still have not heard back from the county planning department. Um, they get 30 days under general municipal law in order to provide us with comments. Um, I confirmed with the clerk's office today that the referral went out on February 25th. So we, the board could not take any action or close the public hearing until that 30 days is up, which is going to be after next week so we're certainly unless the county responds and something changes but i don't anticipate that um we would recommend that the board leave the public hearing open uh, after the march 22nd meeting um this is a good month actually in the sense that there's a fifth tuesday when this board does not meet so it would give the consultants an extra week um to put together any necessary revisions based upon public comment and any comment from the boards prior to this board's work session the first week in April. Um, so the board can consider it again with a, a revised draft in front of you. You can continue the public hearing at your first legislative session in April, which is April 13th. And depending on where we stand then at that point, 30 days will be up from the county. If they do substantively respond, we'll have to look at those comments and see if they need to be addressed and incorporated. Um, but at that point, that's the earliest I can imagine that the, if the board were comfortable doing so that you would be in a position to close the public hearing. And then you would also have the opportunity if you wanted to leave it open for written comments, say for another week, so that then for your second meeting in April, um, your second legislative session, excuse me, which would be April 27th, if you, if you were in a position to, then you could potentially consider adopting the comp plan at that meeting. So that's kind of the tentative timeline that we've kind of been um, thinking about a little bit internally. Obviously, it's subject to change based upon the substance of any comments from the public or the board, um, but that's that's kind of the, the the outline that we're thinking about right now. And can anybody just remind me when we opened the public hearing? Let me, 
It was opened last um, at the last legislative session, which was March 8th, but um, there was a um, we did a town hall meeting on February 15th, where the board um, did also receive public comment on the on the comprehensive plan um, and written comment has been also received through the website. The plan itself has been available for public review since February 1st. And the objectives and strategies I think have been available on the website and we received feedback on those objectives and strategies several months ago. I don't remember the exact exact uh, time frame. Yeah. But, um, right. We did have a survey out, I think in the fall um, on the objectives and strategies themselves. So Which there has been quite again, a bit of public bulk, comment. Bulk of the plan. So, um, so just to be clear, I mean, basically, we've been we've been soliciting um, public comment on the draft plan since um, February, and um, we'll have uh, continuing to continue to solicit public input, most likely till um, close to either middle or, or end of April. Um, so, quite a few months, and we look forward to continued discussion. And again, we have our in person um, high or slash hybrid meeting coming up on March 22nd, um, our next public hearing date. So um, hopefully mm -hmm. that'll be enough opportunity for people to spend some time to, to dig in um, and look at objectives and strategies, which is, you know, you don't need to look at every page of the plan to understand what the recommendations are. And I think it would also be important to note that the public hearing is always at the top of the town board's agenda, so that you uh, that always starts right at 7.30 p.m. So if members of the public do want to address the board as part of the public hearing, it's important that uh, to, to, to come on time because sometimes that does uh, wrap faster than one might imagine. But of course, it doesn't preclude anybody from submitting written comment outside of that time frame. Absolutely. I'm just curious one thing, uh, Christy. Does after the county approves the plan like they did on February, does that tell you, you have to do it in a certain time before it's not good anymore? If it expires or runs out? No, no it's it's there's no it's a 30 day requirement. Basically, um, what they're trying to avoid is a situation that, you know, you send it to the county and then approve it the next day um, where they, they've had no reasonable opportunity to weigh in and provide comment. Um, so there's, you have to wait 30 days, um, to give, you have to give the county planning department 30 days. If they respond earlier, then it's over. Um, but if they, if they don't respond up to and including 30 days, you have to wait the full 30 days. Um, sometimes they don't respond. Um, most often they do. And if they, if they determine it's a matter for local determination, which they may in this case, because I think, I think they recognize um, that this is something that's specific to each local municipality, but they may have some substantive comments based upon um, some planning policies that they're working on. Um, Valerie may be able to weigh in on this also, but really it's just a matter of making sure that they have an opportunity um, to weigh in and provide their comments if they want to. Then based upon those comments, they may require certain modifications. And if the board decides not to in incorporate those modifications, then the board has to act by supermajority vote. Um, so that's kind of the, the little quirk where you have to see what their responses are, if there's anything substantive. And if there is that you don't agree with, then it requires a supermajority vote. Um, you know, I, I anticipate that ultimately the board would vote um, by supermajority, but, but we would have to see what the county is actually proposing if it gets to that point. I'm going to say it's very unlikely that this is going to happen. Um, right. If anything, we're probably going to receive kind of like nice comments from the county. This is great that you did this. At least I think. I don't know. Um, Valerie. Yeah. Maybe. Usually, usually though, if if it's if it's anything, they might um, identify a couple policies that they would like the town to consider. But I think for the most part, I think the comprehensive plan itself does meet many of the uh, like regional policies that the county's been promoting. Just for um, the intent of this law and this referral process to just make sure that there's kind of regional oversight for what's happening on a local basis. Um, and it's a practice that happens in counties all over the state. And we also shared the plan with all of our neighbors. So yes. they also have an opportunity to tell us they like or don't like something, just so you know. Um, 
Okay, I think unless anybody has anything else to add that we can close this portion of our work session. Are you all okay? Or does anybody else have anything else they wanna add or ask? Okay, thank you so much. Um, with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn to executive session for advice of counsel and personnel. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you very much to our planner, to our council, to the entire board, to our receiver of taxes and the audience uh, for sticking it out. And uh, we very much appreciate everybody's participation and of course to, to Victoria Caffarelli for organizing this, especially on a night when um, our computers um, during earlier in the day were uh, not participating. So uh, very grateful for that and for everybody who joined us this evening. We will be back next week with a legislative session that will be held as mentioned in a hybrid format with the town board joining in person at the 16 Croton Avenue boardroom. Members of the public will be able to join us virtually via Zoom or in person. So we'll see you then. 16 Croton, can't wait. Do you remember what, it, what we really look like in person? I don't know. I don't know, we'll have to see. What we look I'll miss like my river. Rest of, the rest of us, I think. From, uh, from uh, waist down, I, at least. <laughs> What were you gonna miss? You're gonna miss your back. My river behind me. Oh, your river, yes. Well, well, we'll have to go to the river after the meeting then. Have a great night, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>